Hey everybody, this is Dr. Guffey, and this is the video overview for Chapter 10, which deals with contract performance, breach, and remedies for breach. There's a lot going on in what is a relatively short chapter, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we're trying to accomplish here. First, we'll talk about assignment and delegation, then third-party beneficiaries, think insurance contracts, contract discharge, damages, equitable remedies, sometimes you don't want money, and contract provisions that limit those remedies. So the learning objectives here, uh, there are five, so it's spread out over two slides here. We'll start off talking about assignments and the difference between an assignment and a delegation how most contracts are discharged. Then when we get into the damages section, we'll talk about how to measure it. What's the standard measure of compensatory damages when there's a breach and how those damages are computed differently in construction contracts. Then we'll get into under what circumstances do you have the remedy of rescission and restitution available and we'll wind up with what a limitation of liability clause is and when courts will enforce it. Just because it's written in the contract does not mean that a court will enforce it, of course. The thing to understand here as we get into assignment and delegation, the thing to keep in mind is the general rule is if you're not a party to a contract, you don't have any rights under that contract. Going all the way back to our objective theory of contracts, the idea there is the parties of the contract have fully negotiated out the terms. So they're going to be bound by it, but not somebody else. Now, in the instance of, a, uh, of an assignment, what you're doing here is transferring all or part of your rights under a contract to somebody else, okay? Um, it happens a lot in business financing when banks, for example, assign the rights to receive payment under a loan contract to some other firm who, of course, pays to get that right. That sort of thing. Uh, um, think of it as, as selling an educational loan or selling a mortgage loan. Now, the effect of an assignment is the third party, who's known as an assignor, and it, you also have, of course, the assignee. Um, the effect here is that the, the new person steps into the shoes of the original individual, the original person who had the right under the contract. Not everything can be assigned, almost, but not everything. If there is a statute that expressly prohibits assignment of that particular right, it can't be assigned. And if a contract is personal in nature, if you um, hire a band to play at the family reunion, you hired that band. You didn't hire that band's cousin. So some things can't be assigned. It's personal in nature. And sometimes assignments will significantly change either the risk or the duties of the obligor. Keep in mind, that's the person who's obligated to perform the duty. There's a, there's a good graphic in the book that will um, illustrate the different relationships here in an assignment. And it involves Alex, Brent, and Carmen, A, B, and C. And it's a, it's a really useful thing, so I, I encourage you to take a good, a good look at that. But, okay, so there's sometimes where you, an assignment will significantly change the risk or the duties. These, think of this as, um, it sounds weird, but an exception to the exception. I know, I, I told you early on, the law gets really, really dense, really, really fast. So slow down work your way through it carefully, and take a look at the case. The uh, Bass-Feinberg leasing case, this is, it's complicated, so go through it slowly to understand the facts. You remember that from our discussion of the Iraq method, because this has to do with a tour bus 
that is leased by Bass Feinberg to Modern Auto Sales, and the lease includes an option to buy the bus. It also prohibited Modern Auto from assigning their rights without Bass Feinberg's written consent. And of course, all kinds of things happen that culminates in repairs being required to the bus. And the question is, who should have to pay it based on the anti-assignment clause? So read over it and you start to understand the, um, the importance of the language and the limitations of what you can and cannot assign. Keep in mind, once a valid assignment of rights has been made to a third party, the third party needs to notify the obligor of the assignment. It's not necessarily legally required, but heaven knows it smooths out a lot of problems. Um, because if someone else is now being bound by that, they everybody needs to know what's going on. So the notice is an important thing. Keep in mind, rights are a little different. Uh, assigning rights are a little different from delegating duties. Delegations have to do with transferring to another person a contractual duty. Those can be really, really tricky, okay? It can be done, but as with everything else in the law, it depends, not everything. If the duties are personal in nature, go back, go back to the band at the uh, family reunion example, those can't be delegated. When performance by third party will vary materially in a large way, from whatever was expected, those can't be delegated. And of course, when a contract expressly prohibits delegation, that can't be done either. Sometimes delegation is perfectly fine. You see this in, think of um, subcontracting for say, shingling your house. Does it really matter to you who does it provided that they are properly bonded and licensed? Probably not. That probably can be delegated. The effect of a delegation is that the person to whom performance is owed, the obligee, has to accept performance from the person to whom the duties have been delegated. Again, you have these exceptions in here, of course. You always have the exceptions in there. There is also a good graphic in here, just as there's one about assignment of rights, there's a good one in here about delegation of duties in the text, also involving Alex, Brent, and Carmen, A, B, and C. So by all means, take a look at that. And the last thing I want to mention on this is this idea of assignment of all rights. Contracts sometimes have this kind of wording. And that can create both an assignment of rights and a delegation of duties. And that's the way the court usually will construe it as those words implying both an assignment and a delegation. So again, words matter. Now that we understand assignment and delegation, we need to look at third party beneficiaries. And I'm gonna actually do this really, really quickly because the big thing here has to do with life insurance. Life insurance is a great example of a third party beneficiary. Think about your basic life insurance contract. Someone buys the policy and pays on the policy to the insurance company. At the death of that person, the benefit is paid to a third party, a spouse, a business partner, a child, whatever third-party beneficiaries. This is an exception to this idea that if you're not part of the contract, because the third-party beneficiary did not pay on the life insurance, this is an exception to the general rule that if you're not a party to the contract, you can't benefit from the contract. These are limited. These are very, very limited. You can have creditor beneficiaries, these are people who benefit from a contract where one party promises someone else to perform. 
And you can also have what are called donee beneficiaries. This is uh, a contract made for giving a gift to a third party. This is your life insurance contract as a donee beneficiary. The intended beneficiary has vested rights in this contract only in a few instances. The third party has to demonstrate the express consent to the agreement. The third party could materially alter his or her position in detrimental reliance on the contract. And when the conditions for vesting as laid out in the contract have been satisfied or have been met, then they have an actual vested interest. Incidental beneficiaries are a third party who benefits even though the contract was not formed for that purpose. Incidental beneficiaries have no right in the contract. They cannot sue to have it enforced. The Tyson case actually makes that really, really clear. And yeah, the Tyson case from 2000, that's the one that involves Mike Tyson biting uh, Evander Holyfield's ear and ending a boxing match really quickly. Some spectators sued, basically saying um, they were, I, I don't even know what basis they tried to bring it on. They didn't get their money's worth, basically. And the idea there was they actually had just paid for the right to review whatever event transpired. So they couldn't they couldn't sue to have the two fight again and guarantee that the fight would go a certain number of bouts. It's a bizarre case. Then again, there were bizarre circumstances. So incidental beneficiaries, they don't get anything, okay? Again, look at the graphics. There's some really good illustrations that give you enough information to get by. This is an area of the law that can get really, really complicated, as can this section about how contracts are discharged. Also a good graphic right underneath the third party beneficiary graphic. Keep in mind, honestly, most contracts are discharged by performance. Most contracts do not wind up in uh, law books, but we look at the exceptions. We look at the weird things that happen. So you have to understand conditions precedent, conditions subsequent, and concurrent conditions. Concurrent, easy. Conditions that have to be, uh, that have to be performed or conditions that occur at the same time. Conditions precedent, that would be a condition in a contract that has to be met before the promise becomes absolute and something that you can't get out of. Sub conditions subsequent are the opposite. Conditions in a contract that, if it occurs, terminate a party's absolute promise to perform. Keep in mind, most contracts are discharged by performance, either by complete performance or substantial performance. How much performance is substantial really depends on the um, situation at hand. Is it Almost all courts would agree that 95% is substantial. Is 80% substantial? What about 70? Where does it where does it change? And that's why some of these cases, particularly with construction uh, contracts, wind up in court. Performance to the satisfaction of another. Maybe it's not complete, but you're satisfied with it. That'll do. However, we can also have some things going on here about breach of contract, material breach of a contract, and also what's called anticipatory repudiation. A material breach involves the non-performance, that's a breach, the non-performance of a contractual duty. The breach becomes material when the performance is not at least substantial. There could be something there but it, it might not rise up to um, the level of being substantial. Okay, any breach gives the non-breaching party the right to sue for damages, but only a material breach 
will discharge the non-breaching party from the contract. Like I said, relatively short chapter, but there's a lot in here. So slow down, go through it carefully, okay? Anticipatory repudiation. This happens when one of the parties indicates that they're just not going to perform. You don't have to necessarily wait until they don't. If they have flat out said, we're not doing this, it's usually because of a fluctuation in market price. Anticipatory repudiation is treated as a material breach. That's the important thing. So it gives rise to remedies already. Okay, discharge by performance, discharge by agreement. It is possible for the parties to agree that the contract is going to be uh, treated as discharged. You can have discharge by what's called mutual rescission, where both parties make another agreement that satisfies the legal agreements of a contract. There has to be an offer, acceptance, and consideration, and everybody just kind of goes back to their corners, all right? Uh, discharge by novation substitutes a third party in for one of the original parties, thereby discharging the prior contract. Um, novation, remember, substitution of a new contract for the old one, and the old rights are terminated. That's what you need to keep in mind. And in the case of, um, okay, accord and satisfaction. The parties agree to accept performance different from what was originally promised. Usually this is because there's some kind of dispute. It's a dispute about the amount of money that's owed. For instance, that's the most common one. If the parties agree that they will settle at X dollars, the payment of that sum of money is satisfies the accord. Keep in mind, you cannot use accord and satisfaction if there is no dispute. In the example I just gave over, say, the, the cost, over, over the money that is owed. Really big deal there. Discharge by operation of law. Uh, this is where statutes of limitation come in, or bankruptcy, material alteration, of circumstances, impossibility of performance. Keep in mind that's impossibility, not impractical. Commercial impracticability might fall under this, but notice how even here in the slide, it says it's a doctrine that may excuse duty to perform. It's not a slam dunk or what is called frustration of purpose. There is a great example in here, the Culloden case. This is a weird, weird case that involves uh, a jazz singer, Culloden, and her manager, who was John Valenti. They also were personally involved with each other, and then their personal relationship went south. After their personal relationship deteriorated, Culloden asked a, a New York court to issue a temporary restraining order. She alleged there was domestic abuse by Valenti. They agreed under a court order to not have any further contact with each other. Well, the problem here is Culloden had signed a, a valid contract with Valenti regarding her professional um, career her obligations, her recordings, things like that. So what happens here? Did, did the no contact stipulation make the previous contract impossible to perform? Or are we going to require this domestic violence victim to work with her um, abuser? This is similar, but not the same to an ongoing matter involving the, uh, the singer Kesha, who has alleged, but not been proven, that she was routinely assaulted by her manager, but, there's a, but she has a contract with that guy. Um, and in that case, we're missing the definitive proof. It has 
destroyed her career, though, because she refuses to work with him, and really, who can blame her? One side, of course, says that she's a domestic violence victim. The other side, of course, says she simply wants out of her contract. It is an ongoing case, and it is a mess. But this is a good example of impossibility of performance and the analysis that a court uses to get there. So always, always, always look at the foreseeability of the circumstances when you're looking at impossibility, particularly when you're looking at temporary impossibility or commercial impracticability or frustration of purpose. All right, so there's been a breach. What do we do about damages? Damages pretty much come in four flavors, compensatory, consequential, punitive, and nominal. Compensatory covers direct losses and costs. Consequential covers indirect and foreseeable losses. Punitive is to punish and deter wrongdoing. Nominal is to recognize wrongdoing when no monetary loss is shown. Nominal, um, these are those cases where the court awards a dollar. It's not about the money always, okay? But let's take a look here at compensatory because that's the, the most common. Compensatory, um, this is, okay, the standard measure of compensatory damages is the difference between what was promised under the contract and the value of the actual performance. That amount will be reduced by any loss that the injured party has, has avoided, has managed to get out of, okay? That's, um, that's important when a court is trying to um, measure what the damages should be. With compensatory damages, you can also um, have these awarded in a sale of goods contract. There, the usual measure is the difference between the contract price and the market price. There's, a, there's an interesting example in the text about that. The sale of land. This is a little harder because each parcel of land is viewed by the law as being unique. So the remedy of a breach of, of a contract for sale of real estate is specific performance. In other words, you have to give the buyer, the you have to sell rather, the land to the person who has agreed to buy it. Construction contracts get interesting because here, it all depends on who breached and when they breached. So read over that part carefully because you're going to get different results if the owner breaches before performance has started or if the owner breaches during or if the owner breaches after the construction has been completed. When the contractor breaches the construction contract, the measure of damages is the cost of completion. So that one's a little easier to measure. I really do recommend, again, look at the graphic about the measurement of damages with breach of construction contracts. It sets everything out real nice and neatly. Other types of damages include consequential damages. These are foreseeable damages resulting from a party's breach, but they're caused by special circumstances beyond the contract itself. These are often called special damages. Um, there's a good example in the book about that regarding uh, quench, but I'm not going to go over that here in the video because, again, I know this one's getting long. Punitive damages are not generally awarded for breach every now and again, but not generally because punitive damages are designed to punish and that is more of a criminal remedy than it is in a civil case. Um, there are, of course, exceptions where punitives have been assessed, but they're not common. Nominal, I've already discussed with you, this is often just a tiny award, like a dollar, granted to a plaintiff when there wasn't any actual damage, but when we want acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Mitigation of damages, this is a requirement that a plaintiff do whatever is reasonable to minimize the damages caused by the defendant's breach of contract. You see it a lot in rental contracts and lease contracts. 
where somebody breaks their lease, the landlord has a duty to try to find somebody else to go into that apartment if, if the apartment is livable. And then that will uh, mitigate their damages. They can still sue for the amount beyond the mitigation. Liquidated damages versus penalties. The big questions there are, was it apparent at the time the contract was formed that damages would be difficult to estimate in the event of a breach? And was the amount set as damages in the contract a reasonable estimate and not excessive? There are some... Uh, weird cases here with liquidated damages versus penalties. Take a look at the Kent State University v. Ford situation. This has to do with a college basketball um, coach. How do you determine if a liquidated damages clause is enforceable with something that is so hard to calculate? Like, how does a college basketball team's record of wins and losses and ranking, how, how do you put a value on that? It's a really interesting case, I think, and it, it does. It shows how business law just goes in all kinds of weird directions sometimes. Next, I want to talk about equitable remedies. Here we're talking about things like rescission and restitution. Restitution is a remedy. Keep in mind, you don't always want damages. Sometimes what you want is equity or fairness, and restitution is one of the big ones. What you want to do here under restitution is put the injured person where they would have been if the breach had not occurred. You don't necessarily want money. What you want is um, to be made whole is the way the law usually explains it. You can also have the equity or equitable remedy of specific performance. In other words, perform as a contract promised. We've already talked about this with sale of land because the sale of land involves a unique parcel of land. Money's not going to make you whole. You have to get the land. Contracts for personal services run in the same general vein. Um, okay, they have an interesting example in here. Courts generally don't want to monitor contracts for personal services because that requires personal judgment or talent when you're contracting for personal services. So the example here is Nicole has a contract with a surgeon to remove a tumor on her brain. If he refuses to perform, the court's not going to compel him to perform. Nicole probably wouldn't want him to anyway because a court cannot ensure meaningful performance in the situation. So sometimes specific performance is not the way to go. So notice the difference there between how we're going to treat land and how we're going to treat personal services. Reformation of a contract is an equitable remedy that's used when the parties have just not perfectly expressed their agreement in writing often due to fraud or mutual mistake. Remember, mutual mistake, bilateral as opposed to unilateral. When a written contract does not correctly state what the parties agreed to orally, and we've already talked about covenants not to compete and how those contracts can be reformed if the covenant is too wide or extends for too long a period of time. You can have recovery based on what is called quasi-contract. Here, again, somebody got a benefit. The benefit was conferred with the reasonable expectation of being paid, and it would be unjust to allow the party who got the benefit to hold on to it without paying for it. The example here is somebody starts digging a pool in your front yard, and you go out and you say, why are you digging a pool in my front yard? And they say, well, we were told to come here and do it. And you go, huh, and just go back into your house. You don't stop them. And they go ahead and dig the pool and they put up the deck and it's just lovely, although maybe you wouldn't have put it in your front yard. And then you say, well, I never entered a contract for this, so I'm not going to pay you. You have received a benefit. You had an opportunity to stop it to rectify the mistake, at which point they would have had to fix your yard. But you didn't stop it it would be unjust to allow you to hold on to the pool. 
Now you get a different react, you get a different result if you did go out and you stopped it. You would also get a different uh, result if you weren't at home to go out and stop it. So quasi contract, we're looking at whether it would be unjust to allow the person who received the benefit to hold on to it without paying for it. And the last thing, contract provisions that limit remedies. Sometimes these are sales contracts. Sometimes these are limitation of liability contracts. Um, the UCC allows remedies to be limited in a contract for the sale of goods. That's, that's allowable. Enforceability of limitation of liability clauses, those get real tricky. Um, obviously, you cannot enforce such a clause that's for an illegal act or a violation of the law. It also, such clauses usually are not enforced for provisions that exclude liability for either fraudulent or intentional injury. There are places where you just can't quite do it. And there's a, um, a sample case there too. So that'll let you go over that. It's, I know this one got kind of long, sorry, but they are trying to cover an awful lot in one chapter here. Uh, and this is one I really do recommend. Watch this one in chunks, go back and look at it and listen to it a second time if you need to. I, I know this one's awfully dense. Anyway, that's chapter 10, and thanks so much. Bye.